I grew up a, a child of a single parent, so my mother was always working. Um, had a great childhood, never wanted for anything, but I knew that um, working um, in a factory was not the life that I wanted to live. So my mother always taught me to get good grades in school and to um, shoot for the stars and to have a good career. So at the early age, I decided I wanted to uh, become an attorney. And after um, I got to the 12th grade, a recruiter came to my school and uh, I went to the table, got a pamphlet, and at the age of 17, I actually enlisted into the armed forces. So uh, my dreams of going to Spelman College and later uh, to law school actually were uh, put on hold for a few years. So I enlisted at the age of 17 and by the age of 18, I became a U.S. Marine. Four years later, I completed my uh, four-year enlistment and was honorably discharged by the age of 21, ready to take on the world. Um, had, I had a good time in the Marine Corps. Um, it was uh, peaceful in the world, so nothing was going on. So thankfully, I was able to, to get in and get out and uh, to move forward with my life. Yeah, it was peaceful, okay. But yes. Marines aren't very peaceful, even when they train. But all right, let's talk a little bit about being a woman Marine and um, women in the Marines train yeah. other women. Was there something that they tried to teach you all or what, have, what to expect when you got out there? So as a woman Marine, I was trained to uh, keep up with the rest of the Marines, which sometimes was a challenge when you are um, a thin 120 pounds and you are you running beside this big burly Marine that's 200 uh, pounds plus solid. Uh, you're expected to do everything that he does and sometimes you're expected to do it better and just as fast and just as good as he is able to do. Uh, and they also taught us discipline to make sure that we're able to keep our composure and to basically keep up because it was a, it was a, male, it was a male Marine Corps uh, and that hasn't changed over the years. But you're expected to do um, the same thing that um, any other Marine was expected to do. So uh, there was a lot of challenges, but um, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. So those four years, I actually had a lot of Marines that were very supportive and they um, made sure that I was able to do what they were able to do while serving. And what did you do in the Marines? I was a radio operator, so it was my job to ensure that communications was ongoing at all times, from um, base to base or um, from different radio uh, operation um, sites. So it was important that, of course, that the radio systems were, were operable and maintained at all times. Was there a reason why you didn't reenlist? Uh, again, as a woman, there were, there were limited roles that we were able to play, and I was actually uh, told that I'd be able to travel the world, and then when it was time for uh, our units to start to travel, they told me that I wasn't able to go because they didn't have certain birthing areas for women Marines. So there were places that they were able to go in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, I remember, that uh, the women weren't able to go because, again, um, there were no, there was nothing that was um, available for women at that time. So after four years, I decided that it was time for me to move forward. But at the end of my contract, um, when they asked you to write what were some of the positives and negatives, and I did write that, that you know, that I was hoping that um, the future Marine Corps would change and that there would be more opportunities for women who wanted to travel um, and be on the ships with uh, male Marines. Well, they have women they do, they do. Uh, at that time, for women Marines, there was not burden areas for women Marines. Um, Navy officers um, uh, could also could go with Navy female personnel, but women Marines were not allowed to go at that time. I'm sorry, we would have welcomed you in our birthing unit. Okay. Plenty of people that work with Marines daily, mm -hmm. foremen, and, mm -hmm. you know, gunners and all these kinds of yes. people. You would have fit right in. But all right, so where did you get out? What, what happened when you got out? Where did you go? What was your plan? Uh, Camp Pendleton in 1988. I received my honorable discharge papers and I relocated back to Memphis. So then I started to, um, to started back to following that dream of going to college and eventually law school. So I did just that. I went home to my mother's house for six months and I knew that's not something that I wanted to, to, to do was just be in my mother's home. So I began to enlist in college and I relocated to Atlanta, Georgia. I started college, I uh, completed my four years, and I went on to get my master's, and uh, I applied for law school and I got accepted. So I went to law school for a bit, I took a break, and then decided that I would just rather pursue my PhD and return to law school later in life. How'd you end up in Houston? 
and I ended up in Houston because there was uh, three opportunities for me. It was either going to be Houston, Chicago, or D.C. Um, so I decided on Houston so that I could start my, uh, my doctoral studies. And um, I packed my BMW and I was on my way. All right. So how did you get involved with the veterans in Houston? How did that come about? So um, I started to look for employment while I was uh, attending Texas Southern University. And I saw some opportunities for, for veterans. So I began to uh, work in case management. And from there, I started to see some of the issues that veterans were dealing with. At that time, I was focused more on male veterans because that was the job that I had. Um, but I started to see some of the disparities, some of the, um, the, the, the lack of opportunities and lack of, of resources for women veterans. And so I decided that I wanted to focus more on women veterans and also incarcerated veterans as well, because I was also seeing some of the barriers and the challenges that they were having post, uh, post incarceration. So at that, so when I was in law school, I got through my first year, and again, I took a break. So when I moved to Houston, I started to work on my doctoral studies. Um, the spark that went off is when I started to volunteer for an um, organization that focused on um, male uh, felons, ex-felons who had served 30 or more years in incarceration. I met a Vietnam veteran. And it was during the time when it was time for them to, um, to, to see if they were able to actually vote for the president. And the Vietnam veteran said, I'll never be able to vote again. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You served your country as a Vietnam veteran, two tours in Vietnam. And um, because of the things that you saw, you came back and ended up in um, prison. And now you're never able to vote. So I saw that that was an injustice. And I immediately decided to um, start researching um, why uh, veterans are having the barriers and challenges even after serving their country. So that's when I decided to start focusing um, on uh, veterans who had served in jails and prison across the U.S. And then later, of course, women veterans, again, the barriers and challenges that they were facing. So I started to look at legislation that focused on women veterans and uh, ex-felon veterans as well. You are a woman veteran. Maybe you didn't deploy with your unit with the men. Were there issues that you stumbled upon while studying or figuring out what you were figuring out that maybe you didn't know about that people should know about women veterans? Was Absolutely. There something that surprised you? Absolutely. Uh, I started to learn about military sexual trauma, which is something I'd never heard of before. So I started to see that there were more women um, that had served, that had those experiences of military sexual trauma. Um, and I started to think about the years that I served and if there was anyone that ever reported that. And I just don't remember anyone ever reporting it. But finding out that there, uh, the, the increased rate of women who have uh, come forth and said that they experienced military sexual trauma was, um, was something that stood out to me. Because again, I didn't, I didn't know that that was actually occurring until recent years. And I started to, to do research to find out why is it that they aren't protected. And, and even after their enlistment, why is it that they're still facing challenges with PTSD and military sexual trauma? And what, is, what still needs to be done to ensure that these women are able to get the help that they need to move forward in their lives? Well, some people would argue that they are getting the help they need. Why is being lumped in with people that have PTSD different? Why is MST different than PTSD? Does that question make sense? Yes, military sexual trauma is different because you just have a total different, totally different experiences. Uh, PTSD can be treated, military sexual trauma can't be treated. You can go through therapy, but it's not something that you can actually be diagnosed with. It's an experience that, that, that occurs. So uh, it's important that we don't lump it together and it's important that we separate so that uh, there would be resources and there will be more attention that would be focused specifically on military sexual trauma. So when did you start working with female veterans like at a high pace? 2015, when I relocated from Austin af after being a policy advocate with the 84 Texas Legislator, I began to, um, to work more with women veterans once I became employed with the Women Veteran Program. And I started to see some of the needs and some of the issues that women veterans face um, post-military. What are some of those? 
some of the issues that they're facing are um, uh, transition barriers. Um, once you come out of the armed forces, you're expected to put some of those issues aside and just become a mother become a wife, become a normal civilian in society when that isn't always the case. Um, there are some issues that women veterans have to deal with um, and uh, even while being a mother and being a wife, being a student, they still have to deal with, with those issues that, are, um, that they have dealt with while uh, in the armed forces. Also uh, unemployment, underemployment, when you come out you, you, you often expect to have the same or similar job that you had in the armed forces, and that isn't always the case. Um, so then the wages may tend to be different, the opportunities tend to be different. So we have to make sure that there are resources that will help sustain a woman veteran while she's trying to get on her feet and move forward. Okay, so 2015 and you're helping women veterans, and um, when did you hear about um, the movement to push Women's Veterans Day in Texas? So 2017, I began to look up legislation that pertains to women veterans and post-incarcerated veterans. And I came across a bill that was uh, recently drafted by Representative Niave. And I called her legislative staff and I asked, what is it that we can do to help uh, push this, this bill to get it passed and, um, and to make it to become legislation? And at that point, um, we decided to create a plan, um, testimonies. But uh, if, if, if you know anything about legislation, it doesn't stop with testimony. That's when the real grassroots advocacy starts. So uh, that's when we begin to, um, to uh, create call logs and, and start getting the, the, the word out that women need to start calling and flooding the offices with phone calls and let the legislators know that this is an important day, that this is a day that uh, we've waited far long to, uh, to create. Uh, and it's not a day that's actually celebrated uh, nationally, so it's not a federal legis not federal legislation. So we needed to start here in Texas to make sure that the women veterans here know that they are appreciated and that they haven't been forgotten and that their service continues to be um, to appreciated here in the state. So uh, as the movement and the momentum began, we began to get more women veterans across the state on board, again, with the phone calls, text messages, Facebooks, Twitter, Twitter, Twittering, um, tweeting, I'm sorry, and just to make sure that we get the word out there to stress the importance of this day. Was there something personal for you that you'll take away from this project? Absolutely. I lost a lot of sleep during that time. Um, we began in April 2017. Uh, we had some challenges, uh, there were some stumbling blocks, but we were able to um, overcome that. So in May uh, 2017, um, the governor decided to, uh, to let this be something that this will, will, will be celebrated, and it was actually signed into law. Uh, it wasn't actual uh, passed or celebrated until um, uh, June 2017, was when the first celebration was, but it wasn't actually um, actual law to September 2017 but because the momentum had been been you know had been going uh, in Dallas they decided to start the first celebration so some of us traveled there and decided to start celebrating so in 2018 it was official so that's when we decided okay it's time for all women veterans across the state to stand up and to be recognized at least on this day to let everyone know that hey I served whether it was in the early 1900s in the 40s or 50s or whether it's a recently discharged woman veteran. Uh, it's important that the state knows that we are here and that we did actually serve. There's a lot of focus on the post 9-11 veterans, but women veterans obviously span generations and there are women that have almost been forgotten. Absolutely. How did you go about including those women in the celebration? So uh, I think that, uh, I felt that a lot of the focus should also be uh, on these women who are, who are nearing 100 years of age. So when I started to find some of those women and start to talk to them, uh, they probably couldn't tell you what they ate that morning, but they could tell you the day that they enlisted. They can tell you everything about their military career, the places that they serve, um, the roles that they played, and just hearing their stories and hearing a few of them say that, um, that they served so long ago that they didn't think that their service mattered. For me, this is what it was about. It was making sure that these women who were in their 80s and 90s uh, recognize that their service does matter and that it will always matter whether they're here or whether they're, they're gone on, that we will not forget about their service and their uh, sacrifice to this, to this nation. What do you think was, who do you think 
what touched you, I guess, the most hearing those stories? With the, what do you think was the common bond for all of them? Was there something similar? Did, did they have, you know what I'm saying, like yeah. common personality trait? Was there something that bonded them all together? Yes, um, and they were of different races and of, of different eras. But when they started to talk about, hey, uh, I was just as good as the person that was beside me, because they were, uh, of course, a few of a uh, few women in their battalions and in their units. So them actually saying, hey, it was just three of us, it was just five of us in a unit of 15 or 20 or 50, they all said that, you know, but hey, I was there to serve my country, I was there to free a man to fight. I was there to play a role and to uh, to make sure that uh, we needed to do for we need to do what we needed to do for this country during that time of war. They must have been tickled pink to get the recognition that they got. They were, they were, they were, were very surprised that. Uh, so many people were coming around shaking their hands and so many uh, newspapers and uh, news stations were actually calling them saying, hey, I'd like to do a feature article on you or hey, I'd like to come and interview you. Uh, and they were, they were just so ecstatic that, that their service did matter. Their service in 1942, their service in 1955 did matter. Uh, and one decided that she wanted to get a uniform and she hadn't put on that uniform since 1952. And for her to be able to put on that Air Force uniform with her stripes, uh, she felt like you know that young 20-something year old back in the 50s when she served. So for me, that was a, a very proud moment to see her and the other women in her era, her age bracket, to uh, just be able to be proud on that day, and be recognized. Why do you think it's important for the younger vets coming up to know these older? It's important for the younger vets to know um, that these women who served opened the door. They paved the way. It's their shoulders that we stand on. Um, prior to 1948, it was very few women that were able to enlist and serve. Um, and if you, uh, you got pregnant or if the war was over, they sent you home. So it's important to know that, for these younger women to know that there was a lot of sacrifices that were made during that time. And um, we need to just make sure that we are paying homage to these women until the day that they're no longer with us. So I think it's very important that women veterans understand that um, these doors were opened by women who came way before us. So how has all this changed, LaShondra? This has changed LaShondra for the better because again, I'm able to see a lot of the things that these women went through that um, I necessarily didn't have to go through. So I, I thank them for what they went through um, because it made it better for generations to come. Uh, in addition to that, to the younger women who um, are no longer here as a result of uh, either suicide or because they, they died in combat, we cannot forget them as well. So it was an honor to pay homage to these women and to let their families know that um, we still honor them and we thank them for their loved one's service even though they're, they're no longer with us. What do you expect to see as time moves on from this first time? I expect to see more awareness. I expect to see uh, hopefully more legislation. Um, right now we're focusing on maybe getting a women veterans monument here in the, uh, the, the state capitol. Uh, hopefully a bronze monument that will be there for over 100 years. So long after we're gone, there'll be um, women veterans that'll be able to look back and say, oh, 100 years ago, there were women who were, who were pushing for legislation and were pushing to have women veterans to be recognized. So it's important that um, the generations to come will see the, the sacrifice and the hard work that women before them put in uh, to make sure that women veterans are honored and not forgotten. Cool.